So we finished up part one by saying that we'd try and analyse this phrase, the rule of law, a bit better than the good bishops from the Church of England. And like I said in part one, I'm more interested in giving you a kind of internal dialectic in putting forth propositions and some of the ways to consider current affairs. The point of this three-part video is to help demonstrate ways in which to consider the news after all. Okay, so my argument is that imbued in the internal market bill example, and really all as regards Brexit, is a greater conflict between two broad opposing ways of seeing and doing things. For example, on the one hand you have the Roman way of law, the deductive way, which becomes what we call civil law, and is the broad European form of law. This form of law takes abstract or general principles and tries to apply them to specifics. On the other hand, you have the Anglo-Saxon way, the inductive way, manifested clearly in common law, and indeed became the English and UK way and parts of the Commonwealth too. This form of law takes specific examples and precedent and applies them to new cases. The former way of law is top-down, the latter way is bottom-up. I'm aware of course that the Internal Market Bill is a statute law, like the Withdrawal Agreement, but the Internal Market Bill sticks up for the Anglo-Saxon way uh, and is itself part of the bigger conflict between the two ways of doing things. Now it's worth using this moment to clarify this type of language, language that I have used in other videos and will continue to use. These are genealogical terms, in other words, terms that express the origins and the journeys and thus the history of these ideas. It is the same genealogical usage that the phrase the West or Western world has, for example, which refers to parts of the world beyond the geography of, say, Europe now. As a historian, as somebody who values history and empiricism and contextualised evidence, you won't be surprised to hear me use genealogical terms. And because the world is itself historical, it also means that the terms gesture towards the effects that they have on people today through that genealogical process. And this allows me, or anybody else for that matter, to write a history, a clear history that both outlines origins, but also gestures towards outcomes. Now, there are those who would prefer me, or anyone for that matter, to use non-contextualised and abstract terms. And I hope by the use of consistent language here, you're starting to see how this might relate to Roman and Anglo-Saxon law and the overall picture of fundamental conflicts. If I used abstracted terminology, then fairly obviously they wouldn't be historical terms, they wouldn't involve evidence or be rooted, and they therefore wouldn't apply to reality, and thus I couldn't give you a history or demonstrate to you the fundamental conflicts presented here. Ask yourself, because it will become relevant later, would a more Romanesque or a more Anglo-Saxon kind of guy want me to use abstract terms therefore? Who would an abstract analysis benefit? Well, unfortunately, sooner or later, some left or left liberal plonker invariably comes along and, like some minor sophist interlocutor in a Socratic dialogue, they try to uproot us and they engage in rhetoric to win the day. And so they might call me a racist because only racists talk about this vulgar Anglo-Saxonism, certainly no historian. And obviously only a knuckle-dragger, an ethnic supremacist could delineate between an English or European way. And look, here's an example of a non-Englishman doing English law, and here's another example of England or the UK doing Roman case law, so ha ha ha, gotcha. Well look, sophists have been popular for thousands of years, and they're not going away. And they always rely upon using the different usages of words to create ambivalence and confusion, and to attack straw men to win artificial arguments. And if anybody watching this thinks that I'm motivated by a kind of ethnic supremacism and that I've overlooked the obvious fact that the world is not black and white, even though the history I present is very clearly a grey one and aware of the grey nature of the world, such as how the UK had Roman law under the Catholic Church or EU, or how Australia and Ghana, I believe, have English-style common law, or that today I rail against the Romanesque Supreme Court in the UK, then I can only recommend that they re-watch my videos and think harder. Now, aside from clarifying my use of terminology, this wasn't just an opportunity for me to clear my throat. I'll link back to this idea of sophistry and rhetoric in the context of Roman law throughout this video, and by doing so, I hope give another living demonstration 
of how intertwined and overarching these deeper conflicts are. Now, if we do value history, it's no surprise that just as English law develops out of the context of the values of Anglo-Saxon society, so too European law develops out of the values of Rome, as almost all European states are founded on the infrastructure, boundaries and manners of the collapsed Roman Empire and its provincial structure. It's why Rome echoes throughout the entirety virtually of Western civilization. It's why we get neoclassicism. It's why the Pope takes the title Pontifex Maximus. It's why the EU is founded in Rome for Christ's sake. And it's why the EU is itself made up of member states whose political history is in Romanesque style of law. And make no mistake, it's probably the effect of Romanism that encourages the bureaucratization of Anglo-Saxon law. And indeed, what develops into the full English legal system is in many ways a response to Roman law. It's the expression of the English identity, in the same way the French have croissants and a pin-sharp societal discourse that makes a Voltaire or a Charlie Hebdo. England, and indeed British society, is a kind of defiance of a nation that, amongst other reasons, also says that we're different. And we too can make law that's at least as good, if not better, than you poncy lot of toga-wearing continentals. And that's what makes us different. My own argument is that, unlike most other countries, it isn't race, it isn't cuisine, it isn't national dress, it isn't a mythological history that becomes what the English really define themselves by. Instead, it is their legal and political system that is the essence of what it is to be English and, due to political developments, I would say British. It's a common endeavour unique to this island or set of islands. This should explain to you, therefore, why so much of my history is focused upon constitutional matters and why I personally am a Brexiteer and argue for Brexit. And it is also, therefore, no surprise to me why, under left liberal governments, not a damn thing is taught about this, since the whole project of left liberalism is to prove that the UK is so unspecial that it doesn't even really exist. So, depending on whether you take the English or European perspective, the rule of law can end up meaning very different things. If you think about the Roman rule of law, what this ultimately amounts to is the rule of will, because it comes down to the will of the person who is making the general principles, which are going to be applied top-down to absolutely everything else that happens in society. Roman society was very aristocratic, it was very factional, and because of that, law was also aristocratic and factional, as well as being related to mythology and religion because of its antiquity. In the end, it also becomes an imperial affair, and circled around a political concept of a state that is inherently politically fractured by interest groups, bound ultimately by the power, and even divinity, of the emperor. The very notion, after all, of the separation of powers, for example, is a distrustful one. It suggests that the state is not united. Roman law, being top-down, thus imposes itself upon society, upon the specific, and is about the power of the lawmaker. But Roman law is also about the rule of lawyers. Because it is deductive, the job of the lawyer in such a system is not to demonstrate the truth of a matter, or at least to argue upon those lines, but instead to demonstrate how the general principle applies to the specific in a way that benefits their client. And the result of this is exactly what you'd expect. Generations upon generations of societies well-to-do, educated in the discipline of rhetoric. The art of sophistry. I told you I'd link it back. The point of rhetoric as a discipline is that it teaches the well-to-do how to be good politicians and good lawyers in a society where their career and success depends upon their ability to argue why they have the right interpretation of the general principle to win their policy or case for their faction or client. Now, obviously, you get sophistry in English law systems as well because it's human nature. But the difference is that in the English system, sophistry is not a fundamental part or even value to it, whereas in the Roman system it is built in. This is why lawyers have an almost comically bad reputation. What was that film, The Devil's Advocate, where the devil is quite literally a lawyer? Harsh, but the problem with deduction as a foundational principle is that its characteristic of applying generalities to specifics allows you to make any argument you want based upon your initial premise. Whereas induction forces you to align yourself with empirical data, with the real specific cases. For example, if our general principle is that war is bad, then it follows that the UK's declaration of war on Nazi Germany was bad. 
and Germany should now sue the UK under international law. Or how about this one? War against dictators is good, so the UK should immediately invade Iraq to remove its dictator. If you have a deductive system, you can create these situations, and then the trick is being wily enough to convince people, and that's where rhetoric and sophistry come in. Just to be clear here, I'm not saying that deductive logic is bad or wrong. In fact, in the abstract, it seems more pure and powerful, which is also probably why it is so popular. But because deduction is such a sweeping form of logic, you have to be absolutely sure about your initial premises. And there is nothing that approaches that level of surety in politics. If you trust top-down legislators to think up perfect initial premises from which all other things are or can be perfectly deduced, especially without having to write contradictory premises, then you're a more trusting person than I am. Instead, the best we can do is have a democracy that elects a government that creates statute law and that therefore is at least somewhat linked to the whole of society and not totally abstract or elitist. Well, unless you have a demagogic system, like in proportional representation systems. But okay, let's not go there this time. My point is that all logic must be applied properly, and that the problem with deductive politics or law is that in the real world, it almost always becomes disconnected from the reality of situations as people argue over the principle and not the reality. By contrast, in the English system, the rule of law refers to the idea that a. everybody is a part of the same society and everybody in society is subject to the law, and b that the purpose of law is justice. The definition of justice is historically rooted and refers to an idea of societal equilibrium in which each individual's rights and responsibilities are protected and held to account respectively by the law. Now again, I'm not saying that no European has a concept of justice or that English style societies are absent corruption. These are the straw man arguments I mentioned earlier. But let me put it to you like this. Why is it that, arguably from its inception, and certainly developing more strongly through time, England has a constitutional monarchy? Whereas by contrast, most of Europe had absolute monarchs that become more absolute over time, culminating in various sun kings and czars, or even popes. Or ask why it was that England famously created common law as opposed to civil law, a system of law where laws are not created by rulers, but governed entirely by precedent, by factual events. Or think of today. Why is it that the UK voter elects a government to write statutory legislation, whilst the European voter elects an MEP to rubber stamp legislation proposed by the Commission? Bottom up versus top down. I think that one of the big reasons this happens is because England is a very early nation with historical roots that value political participation and where the king or government, therefore, must be constitutional and a part of society, not outside and above it. Common law is exactly what you'd expect to arise out of this. And in this context, the rule of law cannot mean simply the rule of a legislator's will, but a common endeavour determined by what is actually going on in society, the aim of which is to maintain equilibrium within society both between each individual and the individual and bodies. And that this amounts to a process and outcome known as justice, the upholding of rights and responsibilities, which are the gift and price of living in a society on the basis of empirical demonstrable fact. And hence, you also get ideas like habeas corpus, or innocent until proven guilty, growing out of this, because in order to convict you, a court doesn't just have to assert it with rhetoric, or clever logical syllogisms, but prove it with tangible empirical evidence. I know people from around the world, from countries, where you have to prove your innocence. That should be a parody of top-down law, and yet, in a way, it's the epitome of it. For me, therefore, this is the only use of the word justice that has any point to it in law. If what you call justice is really only a legislator's will enforced, or an abstract or general principle, applied to all of society, then call it what it is. Call it authoritarianism, or call it theology, religious or secular. If I were to take my cue from the splendid archbishops we saw in part one, I would say that the EU's idea of justice is essentially that of gods in the book of Job. 
It's whatever God says it is. And if we question it or think we know better, then go back and read the new book of Job, the withdrawal agreement, and you'll see that you're wrong and the EU is still right. Well, the EU isn't God, and neither am I for that matter. So let's stop pretending that we are. Let's bring law and politics back down to earth, back into the realm of empirical evidence, and let's create law that abides by that evidence and uses precedent because it's important to remember what happened the day before yesterday. And if we consider statute law, we might say that it is often a cruder instrument, perhaps more of a sudden imposition upon society than common law. As a result, we ought not to use it frivolously, as governments obviously do, and prefer that law created by precedent forms the bulk of law, since it works synergistically and in real time with society, forming law as part of a kind of organic societal-wide empiricism, using observation, not idealism. Statute law is absolutely necessary, of course, and governments have to pass law to enact policy. But equally so, it is much more overtly political too, and susceptible to machinations and corruption. And this is important if we believe that law, as a concept, subtracts from liberty rather than giving it. Since we want to be careful how we use law to take people's liberty away, and make sure it's not done for factional or short-term reasons, or indeed general principles that are dubious in practice. If we put the constant lawmaking and law-breaking of the EU and member states that we saw in part one into this context, then it makes genealogical sense. We've seen how Roman law is abstract, unjust, and invariably, as per human nature, erroneous at best and partisan at worst. This means that people don't respect the laws produced by such a system. As a result, they have no problem breaking the laws when it suits them, because the laws are seen as silly at best, and probably partisan and thus bad anyway. But I think there's even more to it than that. I think that this creates a situation where, since the system of law is very one-sided, it means that the only way the society can stabilise and approximate reality, and thus survive, is for society to break those laws, to test them. So, by breaking laws, the laws get reanalyzed and debated, and the people temper it. The really abstract laws will be got rid of, and the less abstract ones will be moulded to approximate the reality of society, thus bringing one-sided law into a more balanced position with the very people that it applies to. In other words, I think the Roman system of law begets law-breaking, and that law-breaking in such a society can even be called a moral act, an essential one. In this light, it isn't surprising that a narrative of liberation history has become the zeitgeist. This is the natural outcome, since if law is just the will of the legislator, then law-breaking is just the will of the people, and this battle of wills should equalise and stabilise society. This gives law-breaking an edifying quality. It turns the law-breaker into a heroic figure, who is at once a noble spirit and a societal civiliser. But the problem with this narrative is that it imprints the idea that breaking the law is a moral act, that governments are always bad, and the people always justified whenever they rebel or riot or indulge themselves. If you think of Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion, or indeed the Ramonas, the Stop Brexit protests, they think and describe themselves as exactly those heroic and civilizing characters who are only breaking the law because it is for some greater or divine good. Good people are allowed to break the law, so they say, and of course, they are the good people, and they know what's best. I mean, look at that picture of a Remain rally. People's vote for the many? We know that the many are the Brexiteers. It was 52% versus 48%. But only if you have imbibed this liberation narrative, where your opinion is always synonymous with the people or goodness, does the numerically smaller number somehow become the many. This problem is especially bad and inexcusable as well when you live in a society where the system of making laws is actually pretty good. It's been the case that British culture has been pretty respectful of law in the past, and I think that that's because we've had this system of law that is seen to create laws on stable premises. And I think this also relates to the popular grievance that the British have felt for many years, that they were following every letter of EU law whilst the rest of Europe didn't seem to be bothered. And hence also why English and then British history has not amounted to endless revolution and overthrow, but a progression of improvements to the existing system. 
And if you saw my video on Anglo-Saxon Renaissance, you'll see how this fits into the context of what I said there. But Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion and the Europhile plotters all demonstrate just how unheroic, just how primitive and grasping and hating and of course detrimental law-breaking looks and is when you do it in a society that's actually pretty good overall, but you do it anyway and have the gall to call it moral. These groups are what modern-day religious crusaders and inquisitors look like. Let's dig a little deeper. What do we know about Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion and Ramonas? What do they have in common? Well, respectively, one is explicitly Marxist, one is made up of a lot of Marxists, and one has accepted left-wing morality, which is actually code word for the social-cultural Marxism theory. Now, dialectic philosophers like Marx view history and society as dialectic struggles that are inevitable, necessary, good. And believe it or not, Marx's ideas are very related to philosophical liberty. Because Marx thinks the dominant ideas of any era are the ideas of the rulers, then it means that the dialectic is intrinsically related to an ideology of societal liberty, a narrative of liberation history. Because necessarily, the dialectic rests upon trying to break, or at least test, those dominant ideas. And that means getting new ideas. And that means, in the real world, doing or saying or thinking things that were previously thought to be incorrect, bad, or illegal. It means getting new freedoms. But here's the thing. Back in real life, in a society like the UK, where equality movements were all successful, and nobody has less rights than anyone else, which actually is totally in keeping with the historical development of the English and British state that I mentioned, then the dialectic generational quest for freedom becomes, in this generation, the quest for the one freedom you don't have. The freedom to take away other people's freedom. We have a word for that. Oppression. Freedom is now the same as oppression. Think of how the concept of discrimination was bad. Well, in order to have a dialectic, we need to say that it is good. But that's hard to sell in the real world, where everybody already believes that discrimination is bad. So instead, what you do is you have a transitional phase, and you invent something called positive discrimination. Do you see how murky and ultimately violent society can become when your concept of the rule of law is flawed? The societal dialectic view of history, which is implicit to left and left liberal thought, and perhaps for different reasons, nonetheless inherent in the spirit of Roman law, which is factional and sophistic, only results in a battle between two or more wills, or tyrannies, for supremacy. That's why these societies have always ended in revolution, or oppression, or horror, or all three. And now we are seeing a movement in the UK that is seeking to completely deconstruct the very idea of a British or indeed English state. It's a grand dialectic position to take after 1100 odd years of an English nation state. Now, I think the idea of dialectic is inherent to humans. We all do disagree on things. When I first started to think about politics or society for myself, one of my very first observations was the fact that we all disagree with each other. We all have different opinions. So there will be argument and debate and questions, and there will be opposition within society. My point, though, is that this doesn't mean that we have to accept the violent conflict dialectic and all become types of social Darwinists, like the left or Black Lives Matter, or indeed like the Nazis. Hey, did I just make an analogy with the Nazis that was relevant for once? Well, you might remember that at the very start of this video, I said that I would be showing you my thought process, which I described as an internal dialectic. Clearly, then, the notion of testing ideas against each other isn't itself wrong, in my opinion but that what we need to do is find a stable and successful way of doing this. Well, once again, we in the West unfortunately have short memories. We could, for example, realize that we already have methods that harness the dialectic nature of things, such as the Socratic method, where we establish what we are trying to find out, and we then engage in question and debate to find out what that is. And perhaps we could take the system of law and politics where demonstrable evidence, where history and precedent, where justice are the foundations, 
and we could build something like the Socratic dialectic into that system, such that the system produces laws and policies that are, as much as possible, a common endeavour, realistic, and thought through, long before they're ever actually implemented. Well, my argument is that the English-British Parliament is designed to work in exactly that way. The English or British system, which has those foundations I've just mentioned, also has a parliament that is oppositional, with sides that are meant to debate directly, asking each other questions, quite unlike in Roman style rotundas, like in the EU, where everybody talks past each other with long rhetorical speeches. And just as the Socratic method requires honest and earnest interlocutors, so too a national parliament requires honest and earnest politicians that, despite their differences, won't put themselves or partisanship or ideology above the society and whatever binds it, which in this case is nation. And I explained earlier what I think British nationhood amounts to. It's almost like all of this has already been figured out, as if over a thousand years of empirical precedent-based politics and law has allowed the British system to evolve and adapt and fit together, producing a coherent and viable system that works. And hey, we're back to the sophists and to rhetoric. And who was the sophist's great enemy? Socrates. I told you I'd fit it all back in. And as a final, final point, notice that this oppositional style of politics and parliament is exactly what the left and left liberals and the Europhiles say they want to get rid of, on the basis that it is old-fashioned and macho and childish. Well, you tell me whether you think Socrates or Caroline Lucas is the more immature, but to be solemn for a moment, if these people had their way, it doesn't mean that dialectic, the argument, will go away and we live in Teletubby land. Instead, it'll be tossed out onto the streets and we'll thus have traded the Socratic dialectic, or something like it, for a conflict dialectic, perhaps a Marxist or fascist dialectic. And instead of parliamentary debate, we can have the battle of races or sexes or trans. Hey, just like what is happening right now. And our society can become awash with more and more partisan, tyrannical groups like Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion, all of whom think they are absolutely right morally, and factually, and Parliament itself will become just another oligarchic failure of government, producing endlessly abstract laws and ideological policies, and our society will end up looking something like the Thirty Years' War. As per usual, in their revolutionary crusade to rid the world of reality, these people pick and tear at bits of the Anglo-British system, and the result is that this system cannot stand absent its parts. It is a body of mutually supporting organs, and you can no more pick and choose these than you can pick and choose between a liver and your lungs. They work together, and they do so for the fact that they are evolved to work. Well, I hope that that was a slightly more interesting, at least slightly more inquiring look into the concept of the rule of law than the one the archbishops gave. It might seem like we ended up digressing, but my whole point is that from this one little news story, we've been able to find a whole iceberg of ideas hidden underneath. The rule of law is a nebulous term, and there are deep divisions in thought and philosophy and history that play out every single day in every single news story. In this specific example, the law of the EU and the British nation-state have very different genealogies, and they support very different views of the world, and they empower very different groups. I hope, Look, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I hold my hands up. I'm not part of a ruling elite, I'm not part of a ruling class, so I benefit from a system of law and politics that is communal, that is empirical, and that is applied. Now, I just think that history and the kind of explanation that I just gave also therefore demonstrates that this system, the system that benefits me, also happens to be in the interest of a stable, legitimate society that everybody else, except the actively tyrannical, can agree to. I only wish that the other side would admit what their interests are as well. Because when both systems coexist, one of these ultimately has to be supreme, otherwise they just cancel each other out. And thus, whichever is supreme ultimately determines the fundamental nature of your society and indeed your life. It is no coincidence that people that value globalism or corporatism or universalism 
also value EU law and international law in general over the law of nation states because they value anything that can further globalism or universal government. International law is at best tenuously related to any input from the demos. And since it is supposed to supersede domestic law, it also therefore supersedes the nation state and democracy, both of which are barriers to globalism or indeed to communism or the formation of imperial states generally. Romanesque law suits people who see themselves as Romans and the world as their empire. Marx wasn't entirely wrong in his assessment that you'll often find that the dominant ideas of an era support the dominant class. The problem is that this goes as much for the Marxist or the communist or the globalist as much as for anyone else. Do you see how this all comes together? If we return to the example at the start of the video of Roman or deductive law versus English or inductive law, you can see that a good Roman would look at the withdrawal agreement as a kind of enshrined, unflinching document that makes general principles to apply atop of all specifics. And by contrast, the good Anglo-Brit will look at the withdrawal agreement as a contextualized document subject to precedent and due for reassessment in light of empirical information. One sees the agreement as a stone tablet and the other as a living creature. These are totally opposing ways of seeing things. Thus, you could say that it was almost inevitable that a Brexit government would at some point conflict with international law, since the premise of international law is that there is something superior in authority to the sovereignty of the British Crown in Parliament and the idea of the democratically produced or empirically precedentially derived statute and common law, respectively, of the UK. This is a uncomfortable predicament for us. And to be honest, it relates to another, perhaps ultimately more fundamental problem at the heart of all Western or European civilization about what we stand for and upon what premises and reason we stand. But that will definitely have to be left for another time. For now, we can look at the resulting constitutional problems and nasty arguments and social strife that we've seen recently and say that they're exactly what happens when, like Tony Blair or all good globalists, we pretend that history doesn't matter, that everybody around the world is just the same, that the rule of law is just this universal thing that we all know. And by coincidence, of course, all of this amounts to everyone being a left liberal and that this is the end of history and we just sail off into the sunset of an ever larger globalist government. Well, it's nonsense. It's childish nonsense. And to take a leaf from Margaret Thatcher, when you try to book history, history books you. Making politics or law or cultural decisions based upon illusions comes back to bite you. What I hope you take away is that this case is but a farce of the greater argument between two historically different legal systems that are derived from two very different types of society that make very different value judgments and methods of reasoning and thus come to very different views about what type of authority is legitimate and which isn't. I think it is all but by definition that any Brexiteer will reject the assertion that Boris's government is not obeying the rule of law because, at least to me, the Brexit position is that the law of the nation-state democracy is supreme and not that of the EU. Brexit is all about asking ourselves, not just in the UK but in the EU as well, what kind of values our society will be based upon how we derive our laws or government, and what scope of legitimate action they have. For me personally, I would rather my politics and law are brought a little closer to home, where it's easier to keep an eye on them. But we're playing for keeps, so no wonder it's got nasty. In the third and concluding part of this video, I want to take this idea of how we derive our laws and what action is legitimate, to have a look at some explicit reasons why the UK can be obeying the rule of law, even in the breaking of international law, and by doing so, to finish our inquiry into the nature of law, the deeper issues behind news stories, and how to interpret news stories. Thank you.